Happy Halloween season, everyone. It's the month of October as this video goes live, and for many of my friends, this is the most important time of year, so I hope they're having a great time. With that out of the way, it's the spooky season, so how's about some classic Halloween Havoc shows? We're gonna turn the clock way back to the year 1994, predictably. Halloween Havoc, 1990, from October 27th at the UIC Pavilion in Chicago, Illinois. The show is nominated by Thomas Finney over at patreon.com slash wrestling with regret. We are in the midst of Sting's very first world championship run. Of course, I covered Great American Bash a few months ago on this channel. You can check that out right here. And uh, that tells the story of how Sting recovered from knee injury to eventually vanquish the nature boy Ric Flair and get that big passing of the torch moment. But Sting's had a lot on his plate right now in the fall of 1990, not only dealing with the horseman, but also the Black Scorpion. More on him later. It's a curious show because when Turner Home Entertainment released this event on VHS later, they cut four of the ten matches that were on the card, so only six were commercially available. And if you go to watch this show on Peacock or the network, it's also the edited version. It's only a two-hour show on that site as opposed to the three-hour runtime of the actual event. But we here at Regret HQ do have the complete version of this show we're reviewing for the purpose of this video, and you will find out why at least some of the matches were cut. It's also a fun moment in time for WCW because in my research, it turns out they've had this partnership with the NWA and using their championships and everything, but right now there seems to be a tiff between the NWA and WCW, and it seems to be over money or whatever, and so right now the word in WCW is not to mention the NWA, that organization, by name. They still have the championships, they just don't refer to them as the NWA championships. 160,000 pay-per-view buys down a little bit from the 200,000 at Great American Bash in July. 8,000 folks on hand to witness this show in Chicago, while the WWF was competing at the Rosemont Horizon on the same night. Both shows drew about the same number of people, somewhere in the 8,000, 8,100 range, but it was Halloween Havoc that actually got the slightly larger gate at the end of the night. And speaking of Halloween, this show's definitely in the Halloween spirit, beginning with the ring. You've got this weird red canvas on display, along with orange and black ropes and pads. Blue ring apron and posts still, though. You know, I get that it's Halloween, but that is an ugly color combination going on there. Ringside commentary sees Paul E. Dangerously making his pay-per-view commentary debut tonight. He's dressed like a vampire and is joined by Jim Ross, who ironically is dressed like Johnny Dangerously. Tony Schiavone is the phantom of WCW wearing lipstick for some reason as he's on stage interviewing the makeshift team of Tommy Rich and Ricky Morton, who I think are meant to be dressed as greasers here. I thought Morton cut his hair for a second, but it was just a ponytail. That leads into the opening contest here. It's a classic rivalry with a bit of a tweak as the Midnight Express with Jim Cornette take on Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich. Rich. These two are thrown together late on account of Robert Gibson being out with a knee injury. He'll be out for the next several months. The Midnight Express are over huge here as they cheer beautiful Bobby early on. Good classic stuff to start things off. We get the leapfrogs, the crisscrossing, Bobby's taken down. Very unique double submission by Morton and Rich here. Ricky gets down and decks Cornette off the apron. More tag team shtick where the heels keep hurting each other. Cornette's getting his ass kicked. They were only in the first third of this match. JR describing Eaton hitting Cornette as running into a giant mold of Jello, good lord. Morton gets taken down with some double teaming in the midnight takeover. On the outside, Eden goes for what looks like a flying nothing, but ends up being a top rope slap in the face, which Morton bumps for. And at this point in the match, someone on commentary is opening a refreshing beverage. Sunset flip by Ricky, but Jim with the distraction. The baddies stay on top. More manager shenanigans. Mananigans leads to Morton getting slammed hither and yon on the ramp, then the rocket launcher on the ramp. Morton with another roll up and there's a blind tag. Bobby hits a diamond cutter, shoulders back, chest out, baby. Eaton with a perfect Alabama jam, but he wants the ref to do a 10 count. Morton gets up. Another rocket launcher attempt where Ricky gets the knees up. Morton finally tags in Tommy Rich, who unloads on the midnight. He goes up top, but Cornette decks him with a tennis racket. Suddenly, here come the Southern boys. Steve Armstrong and Tracy Smothers dressed as Cornette. Look at the coat arms Strong's wearing here. They deck Cornette, and in all the madness, Rich nails lame with Cornette's own racket. There's the cover and the win. I give it three and a half stars out of five. This was a really fun opener. I mean, this was, it starts out really slow, but it picks up by the end and is so fun. That classic tag team wrestling and psychology that anyone could look back and, on this at any era and watch this and learn something from. There's a lot of great stuff in this matchup here. The finish was a bit madness at the end, a lot of moving parts and everything, uh, but it was still a lot of fun. And that's kind of something that we see a lot 
on this show where there's certain matches that have certain finishes and moments where it's like, hmm, this would look a lot better if the camera angles were just a bit more concentrated and focused and not all these wide shots where you see literally everything. We go backstage to Missy Hyatt, who's dressed as the Wicked Witch of the West. She's got some predictions on the show tonight for her crystal ball and how things will go tonight. Then the segment's done. They cut away from her, but they keep her mic open. Can I see it? Thank you. We go now to our first match that was cut from the VHS release as Wild Bill Irwin, the future goon, taking on Terry Taylor, Rooster No More. The commentary team is joined by Jack Brickhouse, who is a legend of Chicago sports broadcasting. He's really enamored with these young grapplers as Taylor hits a big missile dropkick on the button in the early going, dangerously putting over how Brickhouse apparently called the first televised wrestling match, and Brickhouse corrects him, saying, I was one of the first, but not the first, and then dangerously says, well, if I get it wrong, I stole JR's notes. Then Brickhouse spends like the rest of the match just listing off names of older wrestlers from his day. With guys like Londos and Strangler Lewis and Gus Sonnenberg and Ed Don George and Jim McMullen. Yeah. Andre the Giant and Bob Backlund and Blue Meanie and Luthez, Ganya, Ruffy Silverstein, Dick the Bruiser, Rupert Snyder, Rudy Kay, Dory Funk and Flash Funk and the Haas Funk and Terry Funk, okay. and Cyclone Anaya, Yukon Eric, Farmer Don Marlin. I forgot to yeah. mention Lanny Poffo. <laughs> a light boring chant fills the air as Irwin puts the chin lock on Taylor, followed up with a sleeper, but Terry fights out of it. Taylor with a nice atomic drop into back suplex combo. Irwin with a tombstone pile driver and we get a kick out. Taylor's dumped onto the ramp, but he fights back for a moment. Irwin's getting mad at the officiating and it almost costs him. Spinebuster followed by a very lazy pin is countered into a crucifix. Taylor gets the win. I give it two stars out of five. There was a big pop when Taylor wins this match, but I think it was just because the match had ended, honestly. Like, it was a well-executed match with solid fundamentals, but there was no reason for these guys to be fighting. There was no build to this match happening on pay-per-view. And, you know, it was a well-executed match, but it was just kind of boring. Crowd wasn't really into it, so what are you going to do? Tony Schiavone's on stage, and hey, it's Sting. Sting is amped up as he's getting ready for his title match with Sid Vicious. He also knows the Black Scorpion's around, and sure enough, the Black Scorpion shows up on stage. Who is the Black Scorpion? Well, this whole thing began because, as a legend goes, once Sting won the world championship from Ric Flair, WCW encountered a problem in that there were no heel challengers to go after Sting. They didn't really spend a lot of time building up their undercard in preparation for the new babyface champion. So the legend has it. Ole was just like writing Black Scorpion as a placeholder on the booking sheet. Jim Hurd looked at it and said, great, that sounds awesome. So now they had this character that's kind of created out of thin air as an opponent for Sting, which is not inherently a bad idea, but the issue was where do you go from there? What is the payoff? Who is the Black Scorpion? All we know about the Black Scorpion is that he apparently is a figure from Sting's distant wrestling past, California, 1986. He also brings up Tulsa at one point in an interview with Gordon Soley. The Black Scorpion is played by Ole Anderson in a hood and he's lit in this kind of a silhouette deal and he talks in a very low gravity voice like this. They do have a match at Clash of the Champions the previous month where it's Sting versus Al Perez in a mask working as the Black Scorpion and I'm almost 100% sure that this match between Sting and Al Perez is my first real vivid wrestling memory because I remember as a kid like flipping through channels and seeing well, you know, at the time I saw a wrestler rip off off the mask of another wrestler, but he had another mask underneath. And that's what happened in the finish of this match at the Clash of the Champions. So putting things together, this must have been what I saw as a kid. So it's kind of funny I'm back here covering this many years later. And so as they try and figure out just who the Black Scorpion is going to be, they're filling time with all these very cryptic promos and a whole lot of magic tricks. That's what we got here. Scorp grabs a female stagehand. They both go into a cage. Sting is being held back by other crew members for whatever reason. And when Sting finally gets there, the curtains drop and there's nobody there. But then some other pyro goes off and ha ah, ha Sting, I'm here now because we ran behind the set from one end to the other. Ha ha ha. Ross and Heyman are bewildered at this stunning display of black magic. <laughs> I understand what they were trying to accomplish with this bit, and if I were a younger fan watching like at that time as it was happening, I might have been, it might have been very effective piece of storytelling for me. It might have blown me away, but it's hard for me to kind of put myself in that mentality watching this. If you, if any of you watching this review were little stingers at the time and saw that in the live for the first time, I want to know what you thought of it. Was it effective? Was it spooky? Or was it cheesy? Like it kind of feels like it is watching now. I feel there's another instance in which if the production were changed, 
and tweaked a little bit and we had tighter shots of people and didn't have these wide shots where you can really see all the smoke in the mirrors on display, then uh, it might have been better executed. Our next match sees the Candyman, Brad Armstrong, on one of his many, many, many gimmicks he had in his career, taking on J.W. Storm. Storm is a fast rising up and comer in WCW. He actually had a stint in the Pacific Northwest Territory under Don Owen for a bit. He was actually Art Barr's tag team partner for a bit because when Art Barr had the Beetlejuice gimmick in Portland, his partner was Storm, who was the big juicer. And if that's not the biggest rib of a name, I don't know what is. The match begins. Storm blocks a hip toss and takes Brad's head off with a clothesline. Storm's knocked out of the ring, but he re enters very athletically, takes Armstrong down again, dangerously calling Storm the consummate wrestler of the 90s. Brad fighting out of the chin lock, getting some steam, but he gets dropped on the top rope. A terrible elbow drop followed up with some more nice power moves. Looks like they might have messed up the O'Connor roll, but they cover for it well. Body slams countered into a small package. Armstrong wins and hands Storm his first loss in WCW. I give it one and a half stars out of five. I've been watching JW Storm in like the build up for this show and watching this match. He reminded me a lot of like Sean O'Hare in many respects, where he's like this real tall jacked dude who is super agile and athletic, but he needs a couple of things to really put the pieces together and, you know, become more complete. Uh, and so that's the vibe I got from watching him here. This was a shorter match, not necessarily a pretty one throughout, but, uh, you know, got the job done. You got Tony Schiavone on stage interviewing Jim Cornette, who's got one foot out the door in WCW because of his beef that he has with Jim Hurt at this time. And stuff like this is a big reason why because he's being interviewed while wearing a big garish Confederate soldier's uniform. He says he's dressed like this because he did a little research on his family tree along with the Smothers and the Armstrong families, and he'll have some more info to share soon. At ringside, you got Trucker Norman, a.k.a. Norman the Lunatic, a.k.a. Bastion Booger, a.k.a. Friar Ferguson, and The Juicer. That's Art Barr's copyright-friendly version of the Beetlejuice gimmick, and they're in costume and throwing candy out to the kids. Up next, the Master Blasters take on the Wild-Eyed Southern Boys. Boys. Steel and Blade are played by a young Kevin Nash and Al Green. Speaking of whom, it doesn't matter to me if you're some shoot fighter, if you're some karate. The Southern Boys over big in Chicago apparently. Cornette has joined the announce desk and from here on it's really hard to pay attention to this match. Cornette spends the entire match on commentary alleging that the Armstrongs are a family of cowards and that the Smothers are a family of also cowards but also cross-dressers and homosexuals. And he says these are the reasons as to why these guys are a disgrace to the Southern name and the Southern heritage and everything. Gosh, I can't imagine why this segment has not been brought back on Peacock. Steele's a very strong boy. He takes a missile drop kick right to the face, but is able to keep kicking out of pinfall attempts. Very athletic here as he leapfrogs Smothers. Holy shit, they turn this guy into Oz? Blade goes off the top and gets booted. Armstrong gets the tag. The finish feels so messed up. Nash stands there for about a minute before the ref finally gets in position to miss the double team holding him back. Nash looks like a clown for that. Cornette holds Armstrong back. Steel decks him from behind. The Master Blasters win, but the Southern boys get their heat back by body slamming Cornette, ripping off his jacket and spanking him. Gotta send the fans home happy. I give this one and a half stars out of five. You know, it doesn't really matter what Jim Cornette would have said on commentary in this thing. He was so just overbearing and dominating in this entire thing. It's just legitimately hard to focus on the wrestling if that's your bag. So if you put the commentary on mute and you just watch this thing, you know, for as green as Kevin Nash and Al Green are at this point in their careers, they were able to hold their own pretty well with Armstrong and Smothers, but you know, the match itself, nothing too special. Shivani back on stage with Brad Armstrong. He says he's excited for the rest of this show and he sure hopes that Sting can outsmart that bad old Black Scorpion. Thanks, Brad. On we go to another tag match on the evening as the Renegade Warriors, Chris and Mark Youngblood, take on the fabulous Freebirds. I gotta say, I kept looking at the tassels that Chris and Mark had. I just kept thinking, oh my God, the Young Bucks totally stole their look. As for the Freebirds, they are accompanied to the ring by little Richard Marley, who is announced by Gary Capetta as their number one roadie and best friend. Uh, Rocky King, who recently passed away this year, he debuted on WCW TV a few weeks before this show as uh, the Freebirds henchmen, their stooge basically. He's dressed here as Robert Gibson, doing kind of a limp, making fun of the fact the Freebirds took Gibson out. And JR on commentary, by the way, is going hard on the Freebirds for what they did to him. At one point in the match, Ross and Dangerously argue about the youth of America today and dangerously points out he's 25 years old and when I heard that my body immediately recoiled I'm like he was 
ever that young? Hayes gets bopped around by the renegades and Ross says they're playing Donkey Kong with him, huh? By the way, the reason I'm talking about the commentary in this match so much and not the actual match is because the match kind of sucks. It just goes very long, there's no heat to it, it's just overall a very boring affair. Chris takes all the heat in this match, fighting for survival. P.S. goes up top for some reason, but it's his undoing. Chris does the same roll to the corner for the hot tag Ricky Morton did earlier in the same corner, no less, and it gets zero pop. Double corner punches. Little Richard thrown into the ring. Big distraction on the apron allows Hayes to hit Mark with a DDT in the middle of a roll-up. Garvin pins and wins. I gotta give it one star out of five because at least an attempt was made. I will say this match, like I said, it was super duper long. There was way too much shtick and it was just, yeah, not a very exciting matchup. But I do gotta give at least Chris Youngblood a lot of credit because he was the guy who took all the heat in this match. And the way he sold, the way he fought for that hot tag was something I was really impressed by. So I thought that was something to, to put over. Over. And I gotta admit, it's funny to see the Chicago crowd loving those devious Freebirds. They couldn't give two shits about Chris and Mark in this match, sadly. It's not a classic match, but hey, the Freebirds, they knew how to work a crowd, by God. Shavante on stage with the Horsemen, Ric Flair, Arn Anderson, and Sid Vicious. Arn and Flair, they're going against Doom soon. Arn telling Doom to be there for their match, and if they want to leave out the back door, the life they save may be their own. Flair putting over Sid, who's challenging Sting for the world title in the main event. Call me crazy, but is it not weird? in kayfabe that Flair is so pro Sid in this matchup because the reason he kicked Sting out of the Four Horsemen was he was coming for like his championship and I know that the, the, the particulars are a bit different in this one but it's like Ric Flair, by all accounts, in his character, he should believe that the world championship is just rightfully his. So for anyone to go after it, whether he's the champion or not, should be a huge offense to him. Am I wrong in saying that? Sid says the trick for Sting tonight is to get out alive. And the treat is Sid Vicious rules the world. On we go to the U.S. tag title match as the Steiner brothers take on the Nasty Boys. The Steiners recently beat the Midnight Express for the belt at a house show in August. They had a contract signing with the Nasties in Chicago several weeks ago where the challengers jumped them and got them stretchered out. No one had done that to them before. And from the get-go, this thing is a big, stiff brawl. Jerry Sags the nasty chair shot on Scott before the bell even rings. Sags got evil intentions on the top rope, but Scott slips out and we get a super belly-to-belly. -belly. The match carries on. We get this huge Steiner Bulldog on Sags, but Brian Knobs using another chair on Scott. The Nasties take over. A spike pile driver to Scott. Rick's seen enough. He blasts Sags the chair with the referee distracted. Jerry gets eight stitches for his trouble. Scott taking both nasties down, finally tagging in Rick who goes wild. He sends knobs flying whether he wants to or not. Nasties celebrate early and Rick decks them both from the top. Rick Steiner lines knobs and the poor bastard is spiked on that Frankensteiner. Good lord, Rick and Scott win the day. But the nasty boys jump them after the bell, beating them up with the tag titles. Sags throwing the ref down, they throw Rick into the ring post multiple times. I give this one three and a half stars out of five. This is my favorite match of the night and I love matches that just look like fights. You know, the ones that just get really physical and you wonder for a split second, are they really just beating each other up now? I mean, this was prime Steiner stuff, this kind of activity. And then with the nasties in their prime, this was actually a pretty good match here. Definitely blew away my expectations. And, uh, you know, both teams looked good in all the fighting. You love to see it. And like I said, easily best match of the night. Skiavone interviews the Freebirds next. Little Richard Marley doing his best Robert Gibson impression again. On we go to a Battle of the Dogs, a match that was another match that was cut from the VHS version as the Junkyard Dog takes on Moon Dog Rex. I did not need to see a cut to this extreme close-up of the Junkyard Dog wearing this hideous looking wolf mask. JYD starts strong with the clothesline and the headbutts. Rex brings in a steel chair, but JYD's got no time for that shit. Rex grabs his bone and decks the dog with it. He goes for it again. The referee stops him, and that gives JYD the opening for the headbutt and the win. Rex still kicks out at 3.5. More candy, everyone! I give it half a star out of five. It was not much of a match. And honestly, just looking at JYD here, it looks like he doesn't want to be there. So this match didn't really have the best feel to me and did not need to be on this show. The WCW Phantom tosses back to Missy Hyatt as either the good fairy or the good princess. They were not clear on that. She says there's only one lady in wrestling who knows all the scoops in WCW and it's her. Shivani back on stage with Scott Steiner. He tells the nasty boys they bit off more than they can chew. But wait, what's that concession stand guy on stage doing beating Scott up with popcorn? It's the nasty boys. What a shock. Brian Knobs mumbling some stuff and says the war has just begun. How ingenious of Jerry 
Gary Sags to find that costume and that wig on such short notice. We go to our final tag team match of the evening, this time for the world tag titles as Doom. Ron Simmons and Butch Reed, accompanied by Theodore R. Long, defend against the horsemen of Ric Flair and Arn Anderson. Flair is no longer in the running for the world title contention. It's part of Jim Hurd's very vocal plan to phase Flair out of the main event scene because he feels he's too old and can no longer contribute in a meaningful way to the company. And this, of course, is one of the many things that leads to Flair leaving the company uh, the following year. And, you know, it's just sad to see what they're doing with Rick here. I mean, you know, it's one thing to de-emphasize somebody and kind of take the foot off the gas, take him away from the main event scene for a little bit. But the fact he's like coming out, not even to his own music, it's to Arn's music. Who is this man? Ron Simmons starting strong against Arn. Flair and Arn try to double team, but it backfires. Flair chasing Teddy Long into the ring. Long slapping Nate in the face. Maybe some payback for when Flair called him the N-word once upon a time. Flair going after Butch Reed, but Hacksaw shows off the power. Flair thrown into the corner, almost takes out the cameraman. Sneaky double teaming sees the horseman take over on Simmons. Flair gets the figure four locked in. Arm with some extra stomps for good measure, but Simmons reverses it. Ron decking Flair with a clothesline. I don't think Gary Capetta does live mic time cues in this show up until this point, and they're all really inconsistent. You could tell they're trying to like rush things along because they might be heavy because at one point he was a 20 minute cue, 20 minutes gone by, but even if you included the intros at that point in the match, it's still only 18 minutes and the funny, t the games they play with the time cues gets wilder as the night goes on. Hot tagged Butch Reed, many takedowns. Arn goes for the pile driver, but Reed with a top rope tackle. Arn hits the DDT, but the pin's broken up. All four men are fighting inside and outside of the ring. Match ends in a double count out. I give it two and a half stars out of five. You know, the finish was very disappointing. The fact there was no clear winner, but I, you know, there was some good stuff there in that matchup. And even though you could see this as somewhat of a demotion for Flair, on the flip side, I think this is a great opportunity for Doom, really showing they could hold their own with the Horsemen and with Ric Flair. I, they, they, they looked pretty good during the match itself, but again, crap finish. Stan Hansen's got a mouthful of chew and he's spitting on a little pumpkin and he's getting ready for our semi-main event as he challenges Lex Luger for the United States Championship. This whole thing came about because uh, around September, when they released the top 10 singles rankings in WCW, uh, Stan Hansen placed six, and he was very upset about that ranking, especially the fact that Lex Luger was ranked above him. And so, spent a long time wreaking havoc on him and beating people up, just trying to get a piece of Luger. He beats Luger up in the middle of his title defense against Ric Flair at Clash of the Champions, which helps make this match possible. Match begins, the fists flying, that sends Hansen powdering. Hansen begins to beat down on Luger, trying to wear him down, but he sends himself to the outside run to the corner. More big strikes exchanged. Neither man really giving an inch here. More creative time shaving by Capetta here because he calls five minutes gone and like two minutes after the bell rang. And then four minutes later, it's ten minutes. Stan going off the second rope, but he misses the elbow. Luger comes back, hits the big vertical suplex. Hansen decks the referee in the corner, goes for the lariat, but Luger hits one of his own. In comes dangerous Dan Spivey, Hansen's protege. He throws Hansen's bull rope into the ring and leaves. Stan goes to the shop, but Luger's too quick for him. He comes off the ropes, but Stan hits a ridiculous lariat. He pins and wins clean to win the U.S. Championship. I give this one two and a half stars out of five. Like Steiners versus Nasty Boys, this match also kind of exceeded my expectations. This is a very physical match, but it was a fun match. It was definitely uh, one of those things where a lot of moments of authenticity were felt throughout. There was a little bit of Gaga with Dan Spivey coming out, but that was ultimately not, it didn't really take away from the story. It was just a added garnish to what was else what else was going on in that matchup there. This feud with Luger and Hanson would carry on through the rest of the year. Luger would face Hanson in a rematch of the championship at Starcade. Shivani with Theodore R. Long on stage. He's holding the world tag title belt. He says, homie, don't play that. He says there's no need for Doom to wrestle the horseman ever again. He feels pretty good about that. Am I nuts or did Teddy lose his front teeth at some point? JR, Missy Hyatt, and Paulie at ringside. Missy putting over the fact that she made her prediction of Sid winning before it dangerously did. So that counts. On we go to the main event for the World Heavyweight Championship as the man called Sting defends against Sid Vicious of the Four Horsemen. Like I said at the top of the video, Sting beat Ric Flair to become the world champion and he's been looking for an opponent ever since. Sid Vicious of the Four Horsemen, who's really one of the hottest acts in WCW at this point. He is immensely popular despite being a heel aligned with Ric Flair. He has been pegged to be Sting's first official challenger for the championship on pay-per-view. But really, you know, Sid is the 
the backdrop to the overarching Black Scorpion storyline as I talked about. Sid gets the first shot in when Sting turns his back. Sting is able to outmaneuver him though. Throwing Sid into the ring post outside, Sid powers out of the arm bar and lays out the chance to take over. Sid is caught with a sunset flip after he takes his foot off the gas, but he kicks out. Sid hits a power slam, follows up with some choking. Sting misses his splash. Sid hot dogs a little too much in this thing. He's hit with a flying tackle, but recovers quickly. Sid and Sting fight on the ramp. Sting stings up and dives over the ropes back onto Sid. Love that. More fighting on the outside when Ric Flair and Art Anderson show up. They're a diversion play, though, because what we see here happen next is Sid and Sting get back into the ring, but Sting's face paint is back on him. He's looking a bit taller and a bit less defined. He goes to pick Sid up, but Sid lands on him, covers him for the three. Sid's declared the new champion. We get the fireworks and the balloons, but then Sting is back. He hits a stinger splash and wins to retain the title. More balloons, more pyro. We're out of time. No time to explain. So what actually happened here? So the fake Sting that lost to Sid there was actually played by Barry Windham, who had been off TV for a lot of the last couple of months. In fact, there was a lot of uh, questions at the time if he was going to stay in the company. So far as the fact that the four horsemen were being called the horsemen because Barry wasn't on TV and they didn't know he was going to be part of the group. But Barry Windham comes back here disguised as Sting trying to do something for Sid here. And then what they don't really show you until they have a replay at the very end is this encounter where, you know, Flair and Anderson lead Sting to the back. The fake Sting comes out and does the dirty work. But we get this moment here where the real Sting comes back. He locks eyes with Windham who flees. And that's what allows uh, Sting to come in and the match is restarted. But a lot of that detail is missed at the end of this because it's so chaotic and they're so strapped for time. Again, this is another thing where this is actually a really brilliant finish. This is the most creative finish I've seen for like a WCW World Championship match around this time period. It's very outside the box for them. But again, if production was a little bit different, if some shots were done differently, we saw some one shots instead of others, then that story would have been told a lot better. And I think you could have executed that a lot smoother and it wouldn't have gone down as such kind of a cluster as it's known historically today. Again, I don't have a problem with that finish, just the way they executed it and the way the viewing audience at home got to see it uh, was not the best. I give this main event one and a half stars out of five. Sid has star written all over him. He is so dynamic and charismatic already in his career, but at this point, he's not ready to hold the mantle, not ready to be a main eventer for sure. The chemistry between he and Sting isn't very good here, not befitting a pay-per-view main event for sure. Like I said, finish, extremely creative, just could have been done a little bit better. My grade for Halloween Havoc 1990 is a C, right down the middle for me on this one. Now, this show is not nearly as bad as, you know, I've always heard it to be coming up as a fan. There's some not great things on this show, but there's a lot of not great things in what I review. Like, there's some matches that don't belong on this show, but you kind of understand why they were cut from the VHS release for that reason. The Scorpion stuff, it doesn't work for me, but I can understand maybe it, it hits differently if I were younger and if I were living in that moment there. Like I said, some good stuff on this card. The opening tag team match, despite it being a makeshift team of Ricky Morton and Tommy Rich, the chemistry is there and the emotion is there. I love that one. Steiners and Nasty Boys is an all-out just fight. If you want to see two teams just beat the shit out of each other in a really fun way, this was kind of the way to do it. And uh, yeah, I think, and also Luger and Hanson was kind of a surprise for me, which is why I put it as a pro. I can't wait to eventually reach the exciting conclusion of the Black Scorpion storyline, though, at Starcade. Don't know when I'm hitting that next, but when I do, I'm, I'm looking forward to it greatly. Well, I hope you enjoyed this review, folks. If you liked what you see, give it a thumbs up. Be sure to subscribe and click that bell to get all your Wrestling with Regret content delivered straight to your subscription feed door, as it were. Next time, in two weeks on the Classic Review, we're carrying on with the Halloween Havoc tradition, and it's spin the wheel, make the deal. Spin the wheel, make the deal. Spin the wheel, make the deal. It's Halloween Havoc 92. But until then, I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time.